This morning's uh, uh, a poet's life is full of decisions, as you know, and I was going to walk alternatively behind and in front of that banner, but then I thought it, people might think I was giving some kind of hint as to who might win the prize, so I've decided not to do that, so I'm going to walk behind it each time. So please don't, and I might walk, I'll have to walk in exactly the same way each time as well, not to give a hint, although we don't know yet who's going to win it. Um, our next reader is Maurice Reardon, his wonderful book, The Water Stealer. I've been lucky enough to read all these books so many times, read them over and over again, and they never cease to delight and amaze me. And the first poem in Maurice's collection is called The Lull, and it talks about one of the moments when time just seems to stop. As he writes, it must have been a time when time was snagged in its fluid escapement, and in that lull, no one can enter the world or leave it. And for me, it's in that lull that a lot of Morris's poems happen. That's not to suggest that place is a vacuum or any kind of lack. No, it's, it's a place of mystery and poetry, this lull. So in here, you'll find poems about forgetting names and about cigarettes and about almost missing a plane. And because they happen in this time when time was snagged, they become absolutely magical, amazing images that stay with you like the saucer of streetlight grew brighter. Or in a hospital, the moonscape of the ward. And I was trying to think of a way to describe what it's like inhabiting Morris's book for ages. And it is like when you go to the pictures in the afternoon and you come out and it's still light. And for the first half hour after you come out of the pictures, you're still in the film. And you think they're in the film and you pretend that you're in the film. And that's how Morris's poems are. They just take you over completely. So Maurice Reardon. Thank you, Ian. Hopefully my reading won't be redundant after that. It's, uh, it's good, rather nerve-wracking nerve too, to read in front of uh, such a, an amazing audience. The Cranium After Neruda. I didn't give it a thought until I was knocked down and I heard my soul roll away in the dark. I was dead to the world, gone, but then pain, a spasm, and a throbbing flare of blue lights. Later, I could pick out the moonscape of the ward between sleeps that felt like dirty cotton wool. This morning, my hand extended a shaky finger, poking at the cuts and bruises until it found one item still whole, still game. You, poor skull. How vainly across the years, hustling on the prowl, I'd examine every hair, check over each feature, but miss the prime asset. Your handsome dome, enclosing the delicate wetware of vessels and pathways, the impossibly knotted connectors, all that softly booming vegetal chemistry, a mini ocean into which reason shoots bright bolts and where, among sea rack and fronds of childhood, the fish of volition darts now here, now there. Where to, who knows, my timid soul hides out. Tap, tap, knock, knock, Adam, wakey, wakey. I'm the stone cutter on the hillside, stripped clean of trees and birdsong, bowing to the trusty marble, or a safe cracker on his knees in a vault, his ear to the steel door, trembling for it to open. This next one is uh, it's a movie quiz. So, 
Don't, don't call out the answers, please. <laughs> Gone with the wind. I couldn't remember this morning who was Scarlett O'Hara, Olivia de Havilland, Patty McDaniel, even Clark Gable came to mind. I recalled Olivier, I thought of Veronica Lake. In the end, I got up and Googled Gone with the Wind. I have this problem with names, celebs, exes, school friends, with people, it seems, not places, not the 30-odd townlands of Liz Gould, Welshtown, Bay, Corricondon, Riusk. Later on my run, I recalled 48 of the American states. Wisconsin and Kentucky were the ones I missed. But the other night, I could not remember Jodie Foster, though I chatted with her once in Leicester Square, an ordinary college girl between being a child star and agent starling, queuing outside the Odeon for could it have been the company of wolves. It bothered me all next day, several days, and then on a plane held above Knock Airport, I remembered. First, I felt the shadow of a bird across a lawn, a hint at how her name would sound. There was a pause and a pressure building, but I knew I'd get there. It was physical, like hours after lunch, dislodging salami from a tooth. First the release, then the pleasure. <laughs> then it was hard to stop. I wanted to remember them all, not only things buffs know, like the support role in Once Upon a Time in America. That was Tuesday Weld. But who played Dolores Hayes? Who climbed the Trevi Fountain? Who was that blonde with Cary Grant on Mount Rushmore? Who said, is that a gun? Or are you just pleased to see me? <laughs> OK, Mae West. But why do I always first think Bessie Smith? Why does one good woman now hide behind another? Is there some kink occurring, a hindrance in my brain? After that, I recalled the entire line-out of Cork's 1966 All-Ireland hurling team. <laughs> then went on to the rows of boys in Junior A, Rubberneck, Horse Buckley, Squirt, Brawny, Gentle Brendan, who died, whose nickname I will recall, as though the brain must give the rest of life, going over what's gone before, an unforgiving effort of retrieval, the cornfield I slept in near Pont du Rat, a sand quarry outside Donnerail, Girls whose faces bob to the surface from four white winters in Ontario. Let all of them be well, have prospered, each be loved. Yet may there be the mercy of forgetting. But let me keep to my last breath those few I name before I sleep tonight. Did you get all the answers? <laughs> Sue Lyon pray, played Dolores Hayes. Even Marie Saint was the blonde on Mount Rushmore. But the person I'm really interested in and who should come up to me at the break <clears throat> is the one who stuck halfway through Cork's 1966 hurling team. One more, although Ian has practically read it for me already. Uh, the book is called The Water Stealer, and it's actually a translation of the Greek word for, the classical Greek word for a clock, clepsydra, 
Um, just literal translation. So time, if you like, is, is, is the water stealer in this book. Uh, and at this point, the first point in the book, the lull, is uh, it's, it's where, uh, well, the, the film is frozen, as it were, uh, in the effort to stop time leaking away, which is actually a frightening prospect when you, when you, when you think about it. The lull. It happened on the cinder path between the playing field and the graveyard one afternoon in October when all the leaves of the aspen flipped over and stayed the way a skirt might blow up and hold in a gust of wind. Except there was no wind, one of those days when the thud of a football hangs in the deadened air. But there was no thud, no sound from man or bird. So I'd swear if I'd looked at my watch just then, the digits would have stuck if I could have looked. For it must have been a time when time was snagged in its fluid escapement. And in that lull, no one can enter the world or leave it. The cars stand on the motorway. The greyhound's legs are knotted above the track. A missile is framed in mid-flight. No sound comes from the child's mouth, the open beak, and the shoal of herring is a sculpted cloud shimmering under the glass of the rolling downs. At this moment, when the joker palms the room key, the punching fist can be opened, the egg slipped back under the nesting bird, and each of us could scurry to forestall one mischance or undo one wrong choice whose thorn of consequence has lodged till now before whatever it is keeps the world scary and true breaks loose. A squirrel turns tail overhead, a chestnut rolls to the ground, and with it a drawn-out scream arrives from childhood. Thank you very much.